Welcome to The Thriving Marriage, the podcast for those who want to get their spouse back in love with them and truly thrive. You'll learn why 95% of people don't save their marriage and the secret method no one else is talking about that will change everything for you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's, Let's turn, turn tragedy, tragedy to, to triumph. triumph. Here are your hosts, international marriage experts, Mark Johnston and Heather Choate. Welcome everyone here to the Thriving Marriage Podcast. I'm Heather Cho. I'm with Mark Johnston. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing wonderful. I'm, I'm actually really kind of a, I, I like the, the topic today, so I'm a little bit excited to discuss this. Yeah, it's a little bit different. You guys had asked us uh, to cover this, so we're excited to do that. All right, so today we're talking about marriage versus cohabitation. And we did a poll over in the Thriving Marriage Facebook group and we asked you guys, do you think cohabitating first would be more helpful for your relationship before getting married? Um, would be more beneficial in your relationship before getting married? And so we're gonna share some of your answers there and then what Mark and I have seen as well as what the studies show about this idea of cohabitation before getting married. Well, before we go into cohabitation, I'm gonna share our client win of the week. And this one is anonymous, but she says, I can relate 100%. I initially bought the relationship reboot program to work on at my own pace for $47. It's been a year, but it's been hard, but worth it. He is now saying he doesn't want our marriage to end. I've had many successes, and I think this is going to be a long time before we are 100%. You just have to decide what you want and if it's worth it. Don't give up and work on you. You still have connections and it doesn't matter what he is or isn't doing. The point is even when it looks like it is over, it is not. And there is always opportunities if you look for them to turn things around. So this is, comes from one of our students. We have a couple different online programs. So this student went through our relationship reboot program, which is kind of our flagship course. <laughs> and uh, is applying these things as seen now that her husband wants to work on it with her and to look for those opportunities to turn things around because like she says they're probably well she says they're always opportunities and what mark and i've seen is they're probably more prevalent than you realize and so really making sure that you find that hope and that direction for what you want in your marriage and then apply the right method to get your spouse to want to come back, which is exactly what she did. Yeah, I was, I was looking at this and, you know, I don't want to sugarcoat this at all, but like, I, I think what um, what this person was saying, it is something that we see. Sometimes it takes a while of really being consistent and actually putting in a decent amount of work. And I like what she says, it's like, hey, you have to decide if this is what you want and going through all the trouble is actually worth it. Uh, and if that's the case, then in many circumstances, we can help. Um, but, you know, if it's feeling unhealthy, you know, I, I, it's sad to say I do have that conversation with a, a lot of people. If this is feeling unhealthy, if you're feeling worn down, if it's not worth it to you anymore, then, you know, there's decisions to be made. This person, however, made the decision to stay in and it worked out for her. Yeah. And I would say, you know, most of our clients come to us and they are feeling worn down. They are feeling exhausted. They are wondering sometimes if it's worth it. And a lot of that comes from doing what they think are the right things. And they're really actually backfiring. So the things that you might think are the right things to be doing are actually really ineffective. And when you're doing that, that is absolutely exhausting. And it's no wonder why people get burnt out and wonder if it's possible to save their marriage. So what Mark and I show you is the right things to do that are ultra effective to help your spouse want to come back and build a really healthy, lasting relationship. So when you start doing the right things, then it's no longer the super unhealthy, exhausting process you start to see a lot of momentum, even if it does take time, like it took time to get to where you are, like this um, student shared, she's been working on it for a year and they're still not all the way there, but she says it works and there is opportunity to turn things around if you look for it. Mm -hmm. So, all right, let's move on here to cohabitation. So what is going on with this idea of cohabitation before marriage? Maybe we should jump a little bit into the poll and kind of hear what you guys all thought about it. And then 
show what some of the studies have shown and what Mark and I have seen as well. Yeah. So what was the general consensus with our poll? The, the general consensus was that cohabitating first was a good thing. And I can see why. I mean, it makes sense. And a lot of the comments were saying, well, yeah, hey, you get to know the person a little bit better. You can understand what their quirks are. You can get to see if, like, there's any problems. Because a lot of, like, weird stuff comes out within the first, you know, few years as you get more comfortable within the relationship. And I totally get the logic. It, and actually, when I looked at the poll, it was about twice as many people said, yes, this was more beneficial than people who said, no, it would not be beneficial. And you know what? What's interesting is I remember, this is like many, this is years ago now, uh, many years ago. I remember one of my professors telling me that uh, specifically cohabitation before marriage was not a good idea, like that it generally led to higher rates of divorce. So I was like, am I remembering that right? Because the logic would tell me, like, like many of our audience was saying, hey, you get to know the other person a bit better. And I actually went into uh, to find some research. And I actually found a few, you know, it was like two or three studies that confirmed, like in recent years, cohabitating led to lower rates in divorce. Now, I'm saying this, but I'm also going to say it's wrong, and I'm going to explain why, because I, I, I kept looking at this. I was like, all right, why would there have been a shift? Now, the more recent studies, they concluded uh, that because there's less social stigma for it, that contributed to lower divorce rates. But as I looked further, um, there were some rebuttals to these studies. There's basically saying, hey, these newer studies didn't factor in a lot of things. And so this is where I was like, this sounds, it might sound a little bit nerdy. This is like, this is actually kind of interesting. And I was a little bit excited. Like here are, here's some like intellectual debate. And I did, I, I went into the actual studies and I went in to see how are they measuring things? And, you know, were these good ways of measuring these numbers? And the newer studies that were finding that cohabitation did not negatively impact you know, your chances of staying together. They really, yeah, like this rebuttal said, it wasn't factoring in more long-term numbers and it wasn't factoring in a, a few other key uh, factors here. Uh, here's the thing. When we looked at the, re when I looked at the rebuttal study, uh, what it concluded was that currently cohabitation led to increased stability on the short term within the first few years of marriage. And that long term, it led to, still led to a higher rate of divorce. And I wanna look into this. I wanna discuss this today. And I wanna discuss a lot of different things that contribute to divorce rates. Because cohabitation is one thing. Uh, we, we might be able to have a big discussion on that, but I, I you know, I just, as I got into this, I got more into the statistics and I was like, a lot of these numbers are really interesting. And I'd like to discuss all of this and then discuss what's the common factor with a lot of these stats. I mean, numbers are interesting to, to some, some people, but like, I want to make sure that in our discussion today that we have it applicable to everyone that's listening in. So, Heather. Here's the like. Here's the the crux of this. Like historically, there's some, been some expectations with cohabitation. It's been generally unacceptable. Society would see it as immoral historically, and yes, this would create to added stress within the relationship. So I can see why people want to study it now, now that there's less stigma. But you know, Heather, I, I'm sure you you know people who've lived together for years before they got married. I, I mean, I I have younger family members where that's the case. Um, what was your experience with this, Heather? You, you and Ben, you, you didn't live together before getting married. No, we grew up a little bit more conservative uh, values and stuff. And so um, we chose not to have um, sex before getting married personally and not living together and chose to save those things for marriage. Um, and kind of like this historical expectation with cohabitation, right? It's kind of seen as immoral and it does seem to add a certain 
level of stress within the relationship. Um, but that's definitely not the norm. And we were definitely considered kind of weird. <laughs> and I had, did have friends that are like, you know, what's the big deal? You know, don't you want to get to know him first before you make that kind of commitment? Especially since Ben and I actually had a pretty short courtship in mm -hmm. um, normal terms. <laughs> and so it's definitely seen as a very acceptable thing to move in together and to cohabitate before marriage. And it's often seen as a positive thing. I have friends, you know, and you know, they're very excited about it. They're, they're wanting to get to know each other. They're trying to test the relationship to see if it can, you know, really realistic terms. I had a friend once say, well, don't you want to know if they put the toilet paper up like this way or <laughs> under if it's over the real questions here, right? Yeah, that was the real like <laughs> distinguishing factor. Like, should you marry this man or not? <laughs> I was like, I don't care what he does with the toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> Out of curiosity, for some people, which yeah. way do you put the toilet paper, Heather? That's the important Over. question. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I, you know, I, I don't know if I have a consistent way for the toilet paper. Maybe that, maybe that really bothers Jen, and we have to have a, a heart to heart talk about that. Hmm. It may be the crux, you know, that the, the straw that breaks the camel's back in 20 years for you, Mark. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> but I do understand, like, there is logic in. And some of these things that they're saying, like you want to see how they are on a bad day. They, you want to see how they are first thing in the morning. Like you want to test the relationship under these more realistic circumstances, right? And mm -hmm. see if you can really get to know the person. Um, but for me, I found that there was truth in the waiting to live together until after we were married because we had that level of commitment to each other. and um we started with a really strong foundation is what i believe is what mm -hmm. i felt as we started with a strong foundation of that kind of commitment to each other and that this is something lasting and then when the toilet paper issues come up <laughs> you know that our commitment to each other is stronger than those little quirks and nuances but yeah uh, it's definitely an interesting uh dynamic that's going on mm -hmm. yeah, yeah how about you have a yeah, Jen and I had a similar experience, you know, I mean, you, Heather, I mean, we, we knew each other, like, actually, for those of you who don't know, my wife, Jen, and I knew Heather and her husband, Ben, uh, right around the time that we we all got married to our respective spouses. Um, you know, we, we currently live in different states now, but, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of the circumstances of how we, how we know each other, but, like, so Heather already knows. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife, Jen, and I, we had very similar circumstances. Now, Jen and I, we, we dated for a bit longer. We, we dated for about, uh, well, a little bit off and on, but like all right, around four years is when, you know, is how long we dated before getting married. But yeah, we similarly did not uh, move in together before getting married. We similarly did chose not to have sex before getting married as well. You know, we Heather and I, we grew up in similar conservative environments. And, uh, you know, that was just, that was the expectation. Uh, and I do feel like to a certain degree, you know, for me personally, uh, making those choices, it made the, the choice for marriage a little bit more impactful. Um, now, like I said, I, I get the, the logic of cohabitation before uh, marriage. I have family members who, who choose to do that and I don't begrudge their decision at all. I don't, you know, no judgment there. But the, the you know like here is basically the, the factors at play. Like cohabitation does affect rates of divorce. It, it just does. Um, there are some definite trends, especially in the recent years, as things are shifting. Like just the societal values around marriage is shifting. Like you know, as I was digging into things, I you know the the trend in more recent years is that marriage rates and divorce rates are decreasing in recent years. Basically, people are choosing to get married less, and it seems like those relationships are a bit more stable. Um, we also know, like, just in general, uh, marriage can be a bit tricky. About 40% of first marriages end in divorce, but that number starts to jump up quite a bit. Your second marriage is 60% likely to end in divorce. A third marriage is 73% likely to end in divorce, and it keeps going up. Um, we also know that, you know, currently 
the average first marriage ends in divorce after about eight years, if it's going to do that. Um, and so like it, it really seems to indicate that that would be a really good idea to cohabitate. If, if like the first marriage is only lasting eight years on average, like why do you think this is, Heather? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, and the trends, the patterns that I've seen, you know, Mark and I, we've worked with thousands of students now and looked at tens of thousands of marriages. <laughs> and there's kind of like this arc to the relationship, right? Mm -hmm. We had the honeymoon phase and then we kind of plateau and then things tend to decline as more stressors are added on, as we choose to have children, as we get deeper into our careers, the relationship tends to take less and less of a priority and more and more stressors are put upon the couple. And if they don't have really strong skills in meeting each other's needs and um, communication and trust, then that tends to put more strain on a relationship. And mm -hmm. so that's what I've seen. What have you seen, Mark? I mean, you're absolutely right. It's like, hey, eight years comes in. Like, I think a lot of people can weather some stress for a little bit of time. And especially in the beginning, most, I would say most marriages, if they're deciding to get married, they're pretty happy in the first couple of years, first few years. Um, and then they say, okay, here's some problems and maybe, maybe I'll just deal with it. Um, and then as those as no one addresses those problems, I think this is exactly what happens is, you know, you, like you mentioned, kids and careers and other stressors get introduced and no one does anything about it. And I think, you know, this is very much likely what's going on. Now, there, I want to discuss some of the other numbers as well. And I want to like get into some common factors here because like this is interesting, you know, average first marriage only in the last eight years. And it's interesting that cohabitation affects divorce rates. But what are some other factors? Because and once we look at these, I want to know why are these factors? What's in common with these things? So the first one that uh, came up, so I'm, I'm going to tell you where I'm getting all these. I am getting them from like a, a large study. Um, basically, you know, I, this was up on a, this, all these numbers are up like all over the place. This one happened to be in a family law attorney site, but I've seen these numbers in many other places. Um, I'm trying to find the source now, but it, uh, if you, you really want to look over these numbers, it's www.wf-lawyers.com slash divorce statistics and facts. But anyways, like I said, a lot of these numbers are all over the place. Uh, so some of these factors are your age, religion and divorce, your sexual history, cohabitation, if you have kids or not, uh, there's current factors with COVID-19. Um, let's go through a few of these. So, what do you all think? Does age have an impact? I mean, I just said it. It does. <laughs> uh, basically, getting married younger has a huge impact uh, on, on divorce rates. What do you think, Heather? Yeah, I've heard this as well, um, that those who get married, you know, before the age of 18, the study here shows that they're likely to get divorced within 10 years compared to 25% of those who marry after the age of 25. Um, and so that's an interesting one because I got married at the age of 20. So kind of in this group that's 60% very likely to end in divorce, right? <laughs> if you're between the age of 20 and 25. And I think these studies are interesting and they're illuminating in some ways at the same time. I believe that we choose our fate, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. we, we create our own reality. Absolutely. And um, so uh, it's interesting to have this insight, but it doesn't mean that that's the end all. Yeah, yeah we're, we're going to get your into that a, a bit later because I'm, I'm in this, this category too. I got married when I was 22. Um, my wife, Jen, was 22 as well. And so we are, so the number here that we're discussing is 60% of couples married between. 20 to 25 one in divorce. That's not a favorable number for you, Heather, or for me. Well, you know, I would yeah. say that both of our respective marriages are fairly healthy. And so like, absolutely, we make choices. There's things that you can do to avoid the fate that these numbers are saying. Um, 
It does say that if you wait till you're over 25, you're 24% less likely to get divorced. We also see um, a factor of religion in divorce. If you have strong religious beliefs, the risk of divorce is 14% less. And having no religious affiliation makes you 14% more likely. You know, I like to think that like, part of the factor here, like, you know, Heather and I shared that when we got married, we were both like, um, you know, very much in that conservative sort of religious sort of culture here. And I know for me personally, it was uh, talked about with some frequency, like, hey, it's important. Marriage is important. Family is important. Uh, have, you know, being faithful is important. It was very much ingrained as a value, um, you know, growing up. That was like a thing. Uh, as opposed to like, you know, I'm not going to say that people without religion are without value, but they might not have had that specific value hammered into them quite as much. Is I think probably what's going on on there. Uh, a little bit awkward here, but your sexual history. Uh, this stat here it says women who lost their virginity as a teenager are more than twice as likely to get divorced in the first five years of marriage, uh, as opposed to women who waited until 18 or older. And I don't. Um, the unfortunate factor is I, I didn't see a, a corresponding number for men. I'm not sure why. Um, and hey, I, I'm not going to say. I'm going to say there's no judgment there, but you know it's 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 the numbers. Um, a 2011 study at the University of Iowa found that both men and women lost. Who, oh, here's the, the one for men. Lost their virginity before 18 was correlated with greater number of occurrences of divorce within the first 10 years of marriage. Um, I do think that, like once again, here's a factor. Um, and we're going to discuss this a little bit more later, but like there's this idea of is marriage in and of itself like an import, important institution? Um, are you consciously making choices about your romantic life um, early in life? Uh, are, are you making sure that you are mature enough to make those choices early in life? Uh, and I think that's a lot what this has to do with. Uh, not so much like the morality of the decision. We can set that aside largely. I mean, we can say, you know, there's probably a certain view of, you know, our relationships, we could say sacred, or are they, is just being in a relationship important for, you know, certain kinds of things? Would you agree? Is that, do you think that's what this is about? Yeah, if we're going to take like, Kind of like set the morality the judgment aside right it is mm -hmm. really about um importance significance commitment values yeah. and That's so true. when we bring those things into a marriage it's building a strong foundation and making that relationship more significant more important more valuable and you know you have a stronger commitment to those things so it's emphasizing the importance of that relationship and setting it on a strong foundation. Um, mm -hmm. I can see a correlation there between, you know, um, choosing to have sex before marriage, choosing to have sex as a teenager, and not emphasizing the importance of that in a committed relationship definitely has an effect once you have a committed relationship with the level of um, fidelity that you could have there. There's correlation that could be made uh, with that as well. Um, and then the same thing goes with the next point here, which is cohabitation, right? If you lived mm -hmm. with your partner before you got married, it says 60% of cohabitating couples will eventually get married. However, living together prior to marriage can increase the chance of getting divorced by as much as 40%. If you're a female serial cohabitor, <laughs> cohabitor <laughs> a woman who has lived with more than one partner before your first marriage, then you're 40% more likely to get divorced than women who have never done so. So again, I think it goes back to that, like having a strong foundation of this is important, this is significant, and I'm going to make a commitment to its importance and significance. Um, it's probably some of the underlying patterns going on here. You know, I, I imagine like, you know, just much like you and I, where the statistics are not in our favor, <laughs> you know, there's certainly going to be people who cohabitate before marriage and really weigh, you know, really consider that decision beforehand. And I think, you know, 
in that those sort of circumstances, you can mitigate some of the you know potential pitfalls here. And I, I think you're spot on, Heather, with, with your observation that it is about like how much importance, how much uh, value are you putting on the relationship? And we're not going to say because you cohabited before marriage or because you had sex before marriage, you don't value the relationship. It's just right. no, <laughs> no. But it's you're you may be more likely to you know sit in that camp. Like it, it's not to say you are auto, are automatically devaluing it, but there might be some some of that in some people who choose those those sort of uh, options. Another option uh, thing here is if you have kids or not. Divorce rate of couples with children is as much as forty percent lower. We've talked about this, you know, sometimes in the past, like really having um, some structural commitment, things that really bind you together as a as a couple, can really um, have a mitigating factor against divorce. What's interesting, as I found, is um, if you have twins or triplets, then that actually increases your chances of getting divorced. And I think you you, you mentioned something earlier and talking about stresses, stressors, and uh, careers and things like that. You know, I, I certainly think that uh, you know, one one small child is stressful enough having two or three at the same time, I can only imagine the level of stress that is introduced into that relationship. Uh, similarly, having a baby before marriage increases risk of divorce by 24%. Uh, more recently, uh, there are some looks at COVID-19 and effects on, on divorce. And I certainly think that increased stress due to financial strain, lockdown, political discord, um, you know, you have these situations that where previously simple choices like I just want to go out to the grocery store become much <laughs> more weighted and charged. Uh, we also see that there's increased domestic violence because of close proximity and increased stress, discord, and general strain. Like a lot of factors play into this. So let's get into like the summary here. What impacts the likelihood of divorce? What do you, you know, yeah, we, I, we went through all these now. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, we just stepped into some of them. Like I just kind of cherry picked like a few here and there. There's a whole lot of other factors. But anyways, I was, I was asking you a question. What what impacts the likelihood of divorce? What's the commonality in some of these things? Yeah. So we touched on that, like conviction and those values. So mm -hmm. a good question to ask yourself or any couple to ask each other or themselves <laughs> is: Do you believe marriage or commitment is important? Right. Is that a core value that you have? Are you putting a lot of conviction behind that commitment? Is it something that you really value? Um, so yeah, that conviction, that value there is really important. Uh, like we can see this in like sexual history, cohabitation. Uh, other factors that I saw is whether parents are still married or whether they are divorced and remarried. That has a huge impact or whether your close friends divorced. All of these are like, are the people around me valuing marriage? Do I value marriage? Um, you know, if we look into some other things, it's like, do you have factors that bind you together? Do you have children? Do you have like a, a history together? Do you have, you know, all sorts of things. These, we call this uh, structural commitments, things that are essentially outside of the relationship, not part of the relationship itself, but are binding. Societal values, children, financial history, and uh, marital vows, things like that. Uh, another uh, common factor with a lot of these is, do you actually have an ability to sit down and solve problems? I think we talk about this a lot. Um, one of the stats I wanted to point out again is, you notice how subsequent marriages have higher divorce rates, much higher divorce, like crazy, insane <laughs> divorce rates for those uh, third and subsequent marriages. and you know, the story I tell myself with that is like, okay, here are some situations where this person has had problems in relationships. They get into other relationships and are not looking at how they are contributing to these problems. I, a, a, a favorite question of mine, you know, when someone comes in and says, you know, like, everyone's mean to me and no one is nice to me and no one loves me and no one trusts me or no no one is faithful to me you know i, I like 
turning that question around is like, okay, what are you doing to create all these situations in your relationships? Um, you know, same sort of thing with this. Like if you, you're on your like third, fourth, fifth marriage, it's probably not 100% the other person and you just keep choosing wrong. Or even if you keep choosing wrong, why are you, do you keep choosing wrong? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The same type cycles tend to repeat themselves until we learn from them. And so we've had clients that have come to us on the verge of divorce and the relationship was not saved. It did end in divorce, but that person learned how to sit down, how to solve problems, how to look at internal beliefs inside themselves that were creating the same situation over and over and over in their lives. So that then when they move forward from the divorce, they knew how to solve problems in a relationship. They knew how to communicate. They knew how to work together as a team to solve their problems. They knew how to express themselves authentically. They knew how to remove those limiting beliefs and live as who they really are, become a better version of themselves. And so that's the opportunity that all of us have. Um, more often than not, we're able to help many people save their marriages, but not always. And so the ultimate thing is that it comes down to each of us. Am I going to learn from this situation? Am I going to grow from it? Or am I going to continue to allow it to repeat itself? So I think a, a frequent there. thing that, yeah, we, we, I think we bring it up often. Like I, I, I like this idea from Gottman. He says the most important skill within a relationship is to be able to repair. And I think it applies here. And I, I think, you know, we amend that slightly as I, I I, I will frequently say that, you know, a really important skill within a marriage is the ability to give and receive feedback. Uh, you know, similar idea, uh, just, you know, what stage are you, are you in? Are you in the point where you're communicating about problems or you have to look back and fix them? But, you know, it's very much this. And I, I firmly believe that if you have skills to give and receive feedback or repair problems, it really mitigates a lot of these uh, factors that increase divorce. Right. And the beautiful thing is that most of us aren't taught these things, right? We're not really taught how to sit down, solve problems, how to work together as a team, how to build trust, how to restore it when it's broken, um, how to communicate authentically and respectfully. But these are things that we can learn. And that's exactly what we help people do is that they learn these new skills so that they can do some new things to get some new results instead of doing the same things and getting the same results. I think the third uh, common factor or like mitigating thing, like it's how well you know your partner, your level of intimacy, your level of communication. One of the funny stats that I saw, it was, it was, it was about like um, whether you have regular, <laughs> whether you and your partner regularly view romantic movies and then have discussions afterward. <laughs> <laughs> it was something like, um, something like I can't remember the exact number, but it was like something like twenty percent impact on you know less likely to divorce. But like you know we can laugh at that number. Like, do you watch those romantic movies with your wife? And do you actually? I hate have... romantic movies. So oh man, I've got more stats against us. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, Jen really enjoys them. She's like, Mark, come sit, sit and watch this movie. You know, she, she'll want to watch the period pieces, like the Downton Abbey and things like that, or the Jane Austen stuff. And then she's like, come and watch this romantic comedy with me. Um, but, you know, it just, you know, why would that even be a number? Why would that impact your relationship at all? And, and I, I do think that it's more about, can you share like moments with your partner? Can you like actually talk about the relationship? Can you be light with your partner? It's all like, how well do you know them and how well do you actually like uh, participate in the things that your partner is interested in? This is, I think a big factor in a lot of the stats that we see, like right. getting married early. We're, we're going to put us as the, <laughs> one of the exceptions. Um, but you know, I think, Heather, I mean, you talk about your conversations with Ben, and I, I know I have very good conversations with my wife. So even though us in our respective marriages, we technically got married early, we have these skills that counteract or mitigate um, that risk. And I, I think that's, you know, what makes, um, you know, us go against these statistics. 
Yeah. Again, skills could be learned because I definitely didn't have them for most of my, you know, at least half of my marriage, <laughs> about eight years, we've been married 16. The first eight definitely did not have those. And we also had the short courtship thing going against us too. <laughs> so <laughs> that these are skills that we learned and now allow us to really keep that connection going. Absolutely. So, similarly, like all the other things, like the sexual history, the cohabitation, you know, your family history of marriage and divorce, we could say, you know, we really could put some judgment in there. We're absolutely not going to. We could say those those kind of relationships are doomed, and that's not what we're saying at all. It's, are you aware of the risk factors in your relationship, and have you built skills to mitigate those risks? That's really what this discussion is about. And if you do that, you absolutely then end up in that, you know, going against the numbers and you end up having that strong relationship despite the risk factors. So what can we do, just like a general summary, what can we do within our own marriage to counteract these pitfalls? Yeah, I think like you said, just being aware of what the pitfalls or the factors might be um, that could put us at a little bit higher risk for divorce is important. And then creating those measures within our relationship that boost that sense of commitment, boost that sense of importance, boost that sense of intimacy, closeness, and trust and vulnerability. Um, so that, again, like maybe we haven't learned these things up until now, but now we can learn them so that our relationship going forward can be even better and more beautiful than it ever has been. I think that's another really big factor. Mark, what do you see are some good things to counteract some of those pitfalls? One of the things I, I really like about my marriage with Jen is, and this was a bit of an unconscious thing, but I'm looking back and I was like, you know, that really strengthens our relationship. We frequently describe ourselves as like, you know, in our in our conversations, we're like, this marriage is important to us. We we describe it that way. And we say, I'm doing this because you are important to me, because I value the relationship. We you know, I might not want to go watch that romantic comedy with you, but I, you are important. Like, this is the, basically, like, um, within the culture of our, our marriage, we, we, like, are actively shaping the story or narrative around it. And we're, like, describing it in such ways that we are putting a lot of value in the relationship. Uh, and I, well, like I said, it, you know, I'm not saying, hey, you all have to do exactly what I do, but um, it's something that I value about my relationship and helps me to feel much more secure and allows me to be in a much healthier place in other parts of the relationship. It also means that when Jen and I have had big issues that we have to tackle, we can, um, you know, dip into some of the reserves and say, hey, we've been like describing our marriage as really strong. We are going to get through this. We're going to talk about it. We're actually going to solve this problem. And similarly, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. oh, it just reminds me of the home messages that you teach our clients mm -hmm. is to come back to these home messages, like these home values that we have um, that really define what the relationship means to both of us and helps us get back to that when we start to get a little off, right? When there's tensions rise or there's extra stress, COVID pressures, all that stuff, all the relationship, we come back to that message, like you said, and anchoring that between us that you matter to me, this relationship matters to me, I value you, I value the marriage. And that mm -hmm. really brings it back to that strong foundation. So yes, absolutely is creating that sense of like commitment and intimacy and closeness. I think another factor is not to sit on problems. We, we were just talking about, you know, importance of feedback, uh, importance of the skill in repairing issues uh, and to find ways of, uh, to support each other with ongoing issues. Um, I, I, I've mentioned over the last few months, um, you know, Jen and I are, are seeing a life coach, not because we're doing terribly or like we're at, <laughs> you know, at each other's throats or anything, but we're like, hey, there's a couple small things here and there that we would like maybe some help um, in discussing and we want to do even better. Like for us, for Jen and I, it's, it's an important value to not sit on even smallish problems and to make sure that we are like really aware of, you know, how each other feels and, you know, making sure that we are t addressing any issues that come up. And that was like, so this is 
I'm just being very transparent. This is why, you know, one of the big factors in seeing that, you know, getting some support here. Um, and I think that's a really, I'm going to say it's my value, but I think it's a really important value for many couples to, to adopt. Um, I think lastly is the, uh, you know, if we're looking at what are the contributing factors for divorce, a lot of these were um, basically drifting apart or not really finding time for each other. Um, basically, I, I do think, you know, if you're going to mitigate some of the risks, you need to make sure that you are creating boundaries around your relationship and protecting it from outside factors. Maybe even like your own children, <laughs> protecting yes. your relationship from your own children, uh, from friends, from, you know, flirtatious coworkers or, you know, friends or neighbors, things like that. You know, you need to find some ample time for each other where you can feel close and increase intimacy and security. Uh, and I think those, like, those are the three things, like, if we're going to apply general ideas, general principles to address risk factors, it would be those. It's increase sense of commitment, don't sit on problems, really protect your relationship and find ample time for each other to connect. Yeah. And when we do those things, guys, we can bust through the statistics. I mean, I don't want anyone to come away from this feeling, you know, less hopeful, like, oh man, I've got, yeah, you know, I had sex when I was a teenager and then we got married young and then now we have multiple twins <laughs> and we're not religious. And so everything's going against me, right? That's not the point. Um, the point is that we choose where we want our relationship to be. We choose the skills that we get to develop in this life. Um, just as a little bit of vulnerability as well, I was given a 5% chance of making it to this day with my own life. So a 95% chance of dying from cancer. And that's what the statistics are for women with aggressive stage four breast cancer, um, less than a 5% chance of living five years. So odds were not against me. I mean, odds were against me. What am I saying? Odds were against me that I would, you know, even be alive, but we choose where we want to be. And so I don't want anyone to feel hopeless or discouraged about this. It's about being aware and being proactive so we get to where we really want to be. And if you want some help with that of how to solve some of these problems that maybe you've been sitting on, maybe they're small, maybe they're really, really big, um, you aren't really feeling very close or connected, then reach out to Mark and I and get a free breakthrough call with us at highthrivecoaching.com slash apply. And we're happy to help you do that so that you can bust through those statistics as well. Speaking of busting through things, let's go through our marriage myth buster. Yeah. <laughs> this one is jealousy is a sign of true love and caring. I mean, to me, I mean, that, that seems obvious that, that that just doesn't work, but I, I've run into people who say this. I don't know, Heather, have you run into people? I, I, I've Absolutely. run into people who adamantly say, no, this is, this is the this is the good way. This is the way to do it. Be jealous. Yeah. That, or if my spouse isn't, if I'm not making them feel jealous, then they must not care about me. Right. Mm -hmm. I've seen that one too. There's a lot of like weird messages, like not completely related, but I remember like early on in my marriage, my, my wife, Jen, she was going out at night to just do a quick errand to run, grab something at the store. And she like waited at the door and she, and then she got upset. Like, I, I was like, okay, you know, go have fun. And uh, I'm going to go take care of the dishes here. And she, she was getting upset, increasingly upset. And she told me, it's like, well, if you don't stop me from going out because it's nighttime and I'm a, a female, you, you don't care. <laughs> not, not, not the exact same thing, but like we had, a, we had to have a discussion about that. And we've gotten over that, obviously. But <laughs> kind of like the same idea. It's like, okay, if, if you're not like preventing me from doing something, obviously you don't care and you don't love me. Uh, the fact here is that jealousy specifically is a sign of insecurity. Uh, I believe it indicates a level of unhealth within the relationship. Um, it can be mistaken for love or caring. You know, like, you know, not that Jen wanted me to be jealous, that wasn't the issue, is she wanted me to prevent her from going out or to go out with her, but, um, but 
oftentimes if you're seeing that high amount of jealousy, what's really going on is you're seeing some measure of control or a measure of unilaterally trying to create a safe environment in unhealthy ways. Sometimes I've seen this manifested as like, you are not allowed to go out with friends. You are not allowed to speak to certain coworkers. You are not allowed, you know, um, you're not allowed to continue this contact with a person you've been friends with for, you know, since childhood or something along those lines. Um, you know, like as the example, like maybe the opposite gendered childhood friend, we'll take that. I can easily see how one might get jealous and one might say, okay, you're spending a lot of time with this person, you're talking to this person a lot. And sure, it's okay to have questions here, but the specific emotion of jealousy is not helpful. And it specifically says, I do not feel safe in the situation. I do think that much more healthy is addressing that sense of insecurity directly and working with your partner on how to create more security. Um, oftentimes when I see jealousy in a relationship, the insecurity gets placed on the other partner. Um, always here at High Thrive, we encourage personal responsibility over your own feelings. And if you're feeling insecure or jealous, you know, my, frequently my question is, what are you doing within the relationship to create more security? Are you having those conversations that are needed? Are you actually, you know, working with your partner so that both of you feel okay with the level of security? I'm not saying absolutely go and continue to have very close relationships with that opposite gender childhood friend. I'm not saying that. I'm saying talk with your partner, work out how you can feel secure, take responsibility over your own real, um, feelings, or hold your partner accountable for their own feelings and give them support and feeling more secure. But I will not ever say that, yes, jealousy is a healthy, wonderful emotion to have within the relationship. It indicates a high amount of love. I will not say that. I think that's an absolute myth. And thank you everyone for watching today. Hope you got some value from this. Again, there is more hope than you realize. And we're here to help you get to that relationship that you really want. Next week, we have another topic that you guys have asked for, which is marriage and mental health. Mm. Some of you may be experiencing some mental health challenges yourself, or your partner may have some mental health challenges as well, and you want to know how to have a healthy relationship given these different challenges that you're going through. And so we'll be talking about that with you next week. Thank you so much, Mark. Yep. Thanks, Heather. See you, all. See you everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to The Thriving Marriage, your A to Z blueprint for not just surviving marriage, but thriving. Until next time, my friends, thrive on.